I will talk about much boring affairs, uh, sides of Polotsky. Um, this year we mark uh, 25 years since the, pa since, the pa since the passing of Hans J Jacob Polotsky, founder of the Jerusalem School, as we are known today in the Egyptological world. Why is this Jerusalem school significant and why has it been etched into the minds of Egyptologists to this day? First, the name is clearly in dialogue with the nickname that was given to the great uh, German Egyptologist of the first half of the 20th century, the Berlin School. Second, and more importantly, the Jerusalem School's significance derives not only from the work of Polotsky himself, but also from the work of Polotsky's students. These scholars, each in his or her own way, developed and augmented the Polotskyan model of Egyptian grammar. Israel was home to some of the Polotsky's most eminent students, Sarah Grohl, Mordechai Gilula of blessed memory, as well as Ariel Shisha Levy. Polotsky's hypothesis made waves worldwide with reaction ranging from the extremely negative to the unequivocally supportive and everything in between. Throughout the 20th century and to the current day, Egyptologists have invariably taken on Polotsky's standard model in one way or another. Indeed, a significant number of scholars effectively owe their academic careers to Polotsky, since they made names for themselves, identifying potential weak points in his theoretical framework. At the risk of getting a bit too Freudian here, I'd argue that Polotsky became a father figure to many in the field with uh, the debates surrounding his theory often turning surprisingly passionate. Were Polotsky alive today, he would no doubt be considered, and would probably consider himself, a typologist. In contrast to many scholars of Egyptian language who never branched out of Egyptological domain, Polotsky did a great deal of research also in other languages, particularly Semitic ones. In my opinion, he was able to develop his novel frame, framework for Egyptian grammar and syntax due to his broad and deep familiar, familiarity with Semitic languages. This knowledge allowed him to conjecture, for instance, that most of the Egyptian forms whose morphology appeared to indicate a verbal nature in fact fun functioned as nouns. For Polotsky, Egyptian and Coptic formed a single unit. Egyptian Coptic is indeed the same language that was written in Egypt since 3000 BC until the 14th century AD when the last speakers of Coptic disappeared. Polotsky's whole theoretical framework stemmed from the analysis of Coptic forms, which he believed he was able to identify through syntactic analysis also in the vowelless opaque hieroglyphic writing system of the earlier periods. The meticulous diachronic discussion, sometimes almost decade by decade, is typical for Polotsky's work. He dealt with complex morphosyntactic units and their life cycle from Coptic down to Middle and Old Egyptian, a vigilant trip in time in an unparalleled long period of a language life, almost 3,000 years. Walter Bizang will talk today on the typology of one such complex diachronic development nominalized forms that get reanalyzed as finite verbal forms. With all that said, many Egyptologists still are used to talk about Egyptian versus Coptic. For many years, Egyptian and Coptic were mostly kept apart. 
For example, there were separate conferences of grammarians of Coptic and conferences of grammarian of Egyptian. I believe the difference or breach between Egyptian and Coptic was mainly created by the script systems. The same language was put down in two very different writing systems. Hieroglyphs on their different variations, iconic hieroglyph, cursive hieroglyph, hieratic and demotic. Here you see hieroglyphs and here you see cursive hieroglyphs. <coughs> hieratic, demotic and here Coptic with letters, boric. All hieroglyphic variations presented here are logographic, phonographic, ideographic sign systems comprising hundreds of signs. Yes, it's complicated as it sounds and here are just for the people who are not Egyptologists here who want to understand how does it work. Uh, here you see a hieroglyph, it's, it's uh, an icon of schematic house in Egyptian. This icon or this hieroglyph can be activated as a logogram for the word house and then you have to give it its sound, PR, only consonants we know in, a, in hieroglyphs and also his a pictorial meaning and this will mean a house in Egyptian. But when there are following signs that give us a clue, we know that we have to read this sign as a phonogram in a very different word that has nothing to do with houses, go out. And here you have only sound. The pictorial meaning should be forgotten and uh, discarded. So here you get to the PR that you must forget about the house. The third option for the same hieroglyph to be activated is a, classif as a classifier or determinative. Here is the word nest, you see the uh, logogram of the birds in the nest. And it gets a sign which is mute, has no, s no, uh, no sound at all, but gives us the meaning house and the connection is actually the, the the nest is the house of the birds and I translated it as something like habitat because it comes classifiers of many other words that are uh, abodes of different animals or humans. So here it's actually more than an ideogram than a logogram. But you see that the very same sign can play three roles in the script system. Yet, this very elaborate uh, script si hieroglyphic system, as a rule, uh, does not represent vowels. Uh, it's like Old Hebrew or to certain, to certain extent modern Hebrew. Coptic is revol a revolutionary Trans, uh, tra is the revolutionary translation of Egyptian language of the first century on into alphabetic writing system made basically of Greek letters with the addition of few letters for the representation of phonemes that were not represented in Greek. It is comprised of only 32 non-iconic signs referring to sounds alone. Vowels are fully represented. The translation of Egyptian into Greek alphabetic script system, called Coptic, had obvious gains, but also heavy losses. On one hand, not only that the script became much simpler, but the whole universe of Egyptian vowels suddenly emerged from the dark after three millennia, millennia of writing, providing a tremendous treasure for morphology and phonology. On the other hand, an enormous amount of metalinguistic information that was recorded in the sophisticated hieroglyphic scripts on all its variations, mainly through the non-pronounced the non ideograms called determinatives or classifiers, vanished forever from the Coptic alphabetic records as if they never existed. We must also remind ourselves that without Coptic, the hieroglyphic script would put have probably never been de deciphered by Champollion. Coptic died out as a spoken language, but was used as a, liturgi 
uh, language by the Copts in Egyptian churches and by scholars in Europe by the beginning of the 19th century. In 1822, the father of Egyptology, Jean-Francois Champollion, was able to crack the hieroglyphic code not only through the parallel text on the Rosetta Stone, but also due to his very deep and extent knowledge of Coptic. If we look on his 1836 Grammaire Egyptien, this is the book I like most, we see how he identifies the Egyptian lexemes through his knowledge in Coptic. Here is just one page of examples. You see the pig here. It's written Reri in, in Egyptian, and he has the Rir in, uh, in Coptic, he, the Unsh and the Unsh in Coptic, the Ich and the Eche, and so on and so on. This gave him the, the Chto, the, the old name of the horse. Egyptology of the 21st century detritely strives to go back to the Egyptian Coptic unified concept actually goes back to its forefather, to Champollion. We sit on the shoulders of giants. Uh, on 2015, a new book was published. Carrying the title of this conference, its three editors are here with us. In this book, Coptic Egyptian is the starting point. But the innovative book of Habspelmat, Grossman and Richter means to bridge another very important rift that casts a shadow on the study of Egyptian language, the rift between Egyptology and general linguistics. The book opens with, a, with an article by Sebastian Richter who will deliver the Polotsky Distinguished Lecture later today, with the history of the encounters between Egyptology and general linguistics, the encounter that stands at the heart of this conference. At the end of the article, Richter summarize, summarizes. As this article aimed to show Coptic Egyptian Coptic was a central concern to comparative linguistic throughout the 19th century. This was no longer so in the 20th century. Admittedly, some Egyptologists, such as Hans Jacob Polotsky and Fritz Hinze, were well aware of contemporary trends in linguistics, quite to the benefit of their thought on Egyptian. Linguistic, however, was no longer informed by Egyptology. According to, according to Antonio Loprieno, Egyptian linguistics at the dawn of the, th the third millennium experienced a typological turn. And this diagnosis that is supported last but not least by the evidence for this volume. This very book. In order to break out from this splendid isolation, two steps should be taken. Egyptologists working on the Egyptian language script should write and talk to the general public of scholars in a terminology in a way that will be clear to, to scholars from other disciplines. Secondly, linguists working in the fields of linguistics should take an interest in Egyptian and look on it as just another language of the world, not to be viewed as the sacred language of the hieroglyphs. We have today among our lecturers the first two pioneers that took interest in Egyptian from the field of linguistics. The typologist Martin Haspelmat and the classifier expert Colette Grinewald Craig. But going back to the first step, the second article in the book, Egyptian Coptic Linguistic, this time written by Edna Grossman and Sebastian Richter, takes on the challenge of step one, that of providing the non-Egyptologists with a bird's eye view of the Egyptian Coptic language and script, while reminding the linguists of clear relationship with Semitic languages. Semitic languages form the topic heavily addressed by Polotsky in his various writing, and Semitic typology will be the topic of the lecture by Ran Cohen today. 
Semitic languages and Egyptians share many patterns of word formations. I'm, I'm curious about what we will have to change in our concepts, if indeed there are no words anymore. As the title of Martin Haspelmat already hints. Other articles of other Egyptologists in the Egyptian Coptic typology book follow with linguistic analysis of various topics. The second, the second step is represented by a milestone article in the book by Martin Haspelmat. It gives a bird's eye analysis of Egyptian Coptic from the point of view of a typologist. It is the first overall view of a linguist, a non-Egyptologist, on the Egyptian language since the end of the 19th century. I personally see his representation, representation of the system so refreshing, well organized, even if concise, that I found it an ideal text to be a basic sketch of Egyptian language to be presented also to my students. One feels that Haspelmat looks on Egyptian just like on another linguistic specimen, <coughs> another language of the world to be encountered and described. Aha, it is a right branching language. It has rather rigid word order. Noun, adverbs and adjectives are clearly distinguished in Egyptian and so on and so on. What a relief, no mystery, no magic involved. Egyptology has recently gained another very important bird's eye view from another linguist, this time published in another book edited by Ethan Grossman, Stéphane Polis, and Jean Vinot, Lexical Semantics in Ancient Egyptian. Stéphane Polis is also here with us and will talk about the necessary interface of linguistics and philology in the study of a Coptic and Coptic Egyptian. In, in this book, uh, Colette Grinewald, a field linguist and typologist of classifier system, cast a professional bird's eye look on the classifiers of the Egyptian script system together with me. Our joint article grants the Egyptian graphemic classifier system a legitimate place in the world of classifiers within languages, even though we have to deal here with a classifier script and not a classifier language. Somehow I have the feeling that Polotsky would have enjoyed being here with us today. He would truly had, would have had very nasty remarks on us later. <laughs> <laughs> to meet the young, bright, new generation of Egyptologists that handle the Egyptian language with great linguistic competence. He would surely be thrilled to meet the linguist that took suddenly an interest in Egyptian Although, from the little I knew him, he was retired when I started my studies, I am confident he would have come up with challenging remarks to them. Polotsky and his choice students, Mordechai Gilula and Sal Gaul, practically knew so many texts by heart and could always counter any new theoretical hypothesis with a nice problematic example. But it was great fun and a great privilege to be the student and to be part of the Jerusalem School. I wish all of us an interesting day and I, and I want once more to salute Polotsky for his inspiration and innovation. And thank you all.